What's the balance of words that build and words that destroy? What are you attending to and are you properly attending to it? I can't really navigate this world by myself and no one really could. We, we really need each other. Human beings are inclined towards the good. I don't have to explain it. I just believe it. I change my mind a lot because we grow up. That moment of using words not well during the day and then using the words at night, I'm sorry, was a game changer. Welcome to The Power Of with Noam Weissman. From Unpacked, I'm Noam Weissman, and you're listening to The Power Of. This week, The Power Of Fashion. The Power Of is brought to you thanks to our generous platinum-level supporters, the Mayberg Foundation and David and Deborah Magerman, as well as our additional gold-level supporters, Cheryl and Gerald Hartman, and bronze-level supporters, the Crane Mailing Foundation. To sponsor future episodes, email us at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com. If you're listening to the show, you're getting to know me a little bit, which is a scary thought that I'm opening myself up to all of you. But because podcasts are a purely audio medium, probably many of you don't really know what I look like or how I dress. On the one hand, who cares, right? Why should my looks matter to you at all? My heart, my brain, my thoughts, my words, those are what's important, right? But if we're being honest, ignoring that there's a visual aspect to us is just off, unnatural. So I'm going to come clean. As I sit here recording this, I'm wearing what I pretty much wear every single day. I'm wearing Adidas track pants, a black V-neck t-shirt, and a backwards baseball cap. In short, I kind of look like the same way I did when I was 15 years old. Maybe some of you listening are like, hmm, I'm kind of surprised. I would have expected something different from this guy. A button down, tucked in perhaps, maybe khakis. And maybe others of you are like, yeah, that tracks exactly what I would have assumed. And maybe others are still confused by why we're even talking about this and asking yourself, who cares? Who does care? Turns out, well, most or all of us. I remember when I was in yeshiva 18 years ago, one of my rabbis pointed out that on Fridays in the law firm he used to work at prior to becoming a rabbi, they used to have dress down Fridays. Each of these Fridays, they produce much less than every other day of the week. His analysis, which he wanted all of us to learn from, was that how we dress matters. Look schlumpy, you'll get schlumpy results. Wear a suit with a tie, you'll get suit and tie results. But does this feel true? When I wear something, am I signaling something to others? Am I signaling something to myself? Does it matter? On the one hand, it kind of feels like it shouldn't matter. Like, it's just clothes. Who I am on the inside is what matters. Think about the other episodes of this show we've released so far about happiness, empathy. Those are important. Fashion, clothing, come on. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that it's almost human nature to think about fashion, about dress, our own and others, and what it says about ourselves and others. Does it matter if I buy my clothing from Zara? By the way, I'm often a Zara guy. Though after this episode, not so sure anymore. Is it natural but superficial to care about fashion and dress? And we should fight against that instinct? Is this conversation superficial altogether? Or if it relates to human nature in some deep way, does that mean it really, truly matters? To figure this out, I met with Javi Lieber. Javi is a really phenomenally interesting person. She's a journalist with a focus on fashion and business, whose work has appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, and Vox.com. But more important for our purposes, she's a fashion writer who focuses on grappling with why it matters. I love talking to Javi and can't wait to introduce her to you. And with that, friends and family, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Javi Lieber. Javi. Welcome to The Power Of. So good to have you on the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I got to be honest with you, Javi. Uh, we've done a number of episodes here, and we speak a lot about how Judaism has a lot to say about all different topics. I'm most nervous about this topic, fashion and dress. I'm most nervous about this. That makes sense. I think for some people, uh, they don't even think about what they wear and what they shop and why they're choosing the things that they choose to wear. Uh, but for a lot of people, it's like, you know, it's there are so many motivators for the labels that they buy, the colors that they wear, 
um, how it makes them feel, what it reminds them of, um, and so on. So, I mean, maybe you're nervous because you have zero feelings, or maybe you're nervous because you actually have a lot of feelings. It's probably both. And also because I don't think I have the best fashion sense one way or the other. Like if you look at me now, and we'll get into this, I'm wearing a gray t-shirt and like backwards, that like whatever. That's how I'm presenting myself today. And I want to get into that. I want to get into what that means and why it matters. And also because I think that Judaism does have a lot to say on this topic. And the question of how we integrate Jewish thought into our behavior is fraught with controversy with uh different perspectives on the topic and certainly it's really critical to our identities this is a really important conversation so javi thank you so much for being here and for having this conversation with me yeah i'm excited to dive in i think a lot of people think of judaism as a religion that is not necessarily so focused on fashion but i think uh it's actually quite the opposite i think it's a religion that is deeply intertwined with fashion from biblical and also um, from contemporary times, there's there's so much here. I want you to hold on to that. Uh, I actually, my sister is in fashion. I should have mentioned that. My sister, shout out to Maian Weissman. She's in fashion. I have some connection to this world, but I want to know where your passion for fashion came from. You know, so if you talk to a lot of fashion editors and reporters, a lot of them have a similar background, you know, saying that they grew up collecting Vogue magazines and pinning Harper's Bazaar editorials onto their walls. I came from a background that was completely the opposite. Um, I grew up in an ultra-Orthodox community where for much of my life, uh, the topic of clothing and dressing uh, was actually really, really complicated. Uh, without getting too much into it, you know, there's a lot of baggage that comes um, with women and clothes in the Jewish community, uh, the community that I grew up in. Uh, but a lot of what I was told was, you know, this is off limits some items of clothing and some colors and some styles were so taboo for me that I was like really interested in it. Like every good teenage girl, I would spend my Sundays at the mall. You know, my mom would drop me off and I'd walk around with my friends and we would go to these, you know, taboo places that, you know, in our religion, we could or kind of looking at. And at these different stores, there were all these different- Hollister? Was it Hollister? Well, I was just about to say, you know, we'd walk to, we'd walk into Hot Topic. And in that store, I understood like, this is where- you know, angry kids hung and like, this is where colors like, you know, black and, uh, you know, sort of like the goth movement, like this is where these kids thrive. And I wonder why. And I would just sort of like look around and look at the clothing and understand that the kids were expressing themselves in a very specific type of style. And then you would walk across the mall and you'd walk into a place like J. Crew, and you would think, oh, this is prep style. This is how people express themselves in a different way and try to, you know, sort of like unpack and um, dissect what it means to be preppy or in quote unquote upper class. Um, and then I would go down down the corridor and look at uh, urban outfitters and, you know, look at like counterculture t-shirts and sort of like trendy hipster aesthetic. And all these different stores just really painted um, just different communities for me. And I thought it was, I always thought it was very, very interesting for how these different types of clothing allowed teenagers specifically to express themselves. After high school, I took a gap year. I studied in Israel for a year and a half at a seminary uh, in, a, in a yeshiva. And uh, in Israel, actually, is where I noticed that, like, this is not just something that uh, teenage kids and, you know, the Carters of the mall, um, where, where these ideas hold. Israel is actually uh, such a colorful country and has such different perspectives for community and identity and religion. And in those pockets, you actually see those uh, expressions, uh, living out in people's clothing. Um, I remember specifically, you know, going to like some of these, um, outward settlements and the women would wear these really flowy flowery skirts and like big colorful turbans. Uh, and I thought, you know, there's something here. There's a way in which like these different communities are expressing themselves in clothing. Um, and then I would actually say like quite the opposite. You'd walk around certain neighborhoods of Jerusalem and everybody is wearing, um, you know, really like ba baggier clothes, really muted, minimalist colors. And they're just meant to sort of, you know, not be seen. Um, and that is also uh, really, really expressive in the type of lifestyle that they're living. And I even saw it with some of my friends that were studying in Israel. You know, they're there for a month and all of a sudden they completely changed their clothing. They're, they went from wearing baggy shirts and, and jeans to wearing button downs and slacks. And I'm thinking like, you've been here a month, you know, like how different could you possibly been, but I think that they were trying to make these statements um, about their clothing and what it means to them. 
Uh, and I, I always thought that this was really interesting. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I um, went to school for journalism and I took a job um, as a news reporter at a startup. And I wrote a lot about news and culture. And the theme that just kept coming up again and again was this topic of fashion. This just seemed like a topic that in many ways I was meant to cover. You know, I'm interested in unpacking, no pun intended, um, I'm, I'm interested in uncovering, you know, why people uh, buy certain labels over others. And then from designers' perspectives, how they make clothes and uh, what that means for them. What are they trying to bring from their heritage? What do they want consumers to feel? And uh, how it relates to the world at large. Javi, the way you just described fashion and clothing, it's so different than the way many of us consciously, when we wake up in the morning and we put something on that we're necessarily thinking about. But you're like, you're an uber professional. You're an expert in in thinking about the clothing that we wear and the clothing that we choose to wear. There are two Jewish ideas that I want to share with you and kind of get your thoughts on. Idea number one is from a great 19th century German uh, neo-Orthodox, which is the precursor to modern Orthodoxy, thinker named Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. And he said, a person's clothes are a sign of that person's qualities. So when you're describing J. Crew and when we're talking about Hollister, and we're talking about, you know, um, uh, Abercrombie, and whatever clothing that you choose to wear, that there is to a degree what Rabbi Hirsch is saying is that one's qualities are seen in the clothing they choose to wear. Okay, let's hold on to that idea. And the other idea is this, I don't know if it was Rabbi Jonathan Sachs who came up with it, but he notes that the shoresh, the root of the word clothing, bet gimel dalid, which means clothing, is the same shoresh, is the same root as the word for uh, someone who is a traitor, a boged, bet gimel dalid, that we deceive others with the clothing that we wear. Or maybe we deceive ourselves. And when you mentioned this fascinating, I remember when I went to Israel for the year, I was incredibly conscientious about the clothing I, cho I chose to wear. And at the end of my first year in yeshiva studying in Israel, I came back, I put on khaki pants, like you describe, a button-down shirt, tucked in, and you know that was, that was what I chose to do. And then I went back a second year to Israel, and I made a decision. I said, you know what? I want to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be learning Torah from the morning to the night, but I'm going to be doing it in jeans and a t-shirt. I tried to like kind of buck that trend, but it became part of my identity. That's like, that became part of my identity. Sure. Right? How do you see that? Uh, I actually think both of those ideas are one and the same. Uh, basically, what both commentaries are saying is that um, your clothing is a way for you to self-express. It is a way in which you can uh, deceive people and trick them, you know, so to speak, into thinking certain things about you. It's also a way you can trick yourself. Uh, the experience that you just sh shared about how you decided to change and dress, that is how uh, so many people around the world get into, quote unquote, the zone. Um, and then, you know, from the flip What's the zone? It could be whatever. It could be the way you want to feel, the way you want to communicate, the way you want to act. You're almost putting on a costume. It could just be a bent down shirt and slacks. But when you are wearing clothing that makes you feel a certain way, it could then move you to act a certain way, to talk, to speak a certain way, to think a certain way. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost considered like armor. Mm. I want to share something with you. A few years ago, I wrote a story about the charity called Dress for Success. It is an organization that helps disenfranchised women um, have job placement and get interviews and go out, go out into the workforce. Uh, some of these women are, um, they serve time in prison. Some of them are coming from shelters and so on. Um, and I thought this was such an inter interesting charity because in addition to job training and, and helping with interview techniques, the first thing that it starts with is these women go to the Dress for Success headquarters um, and they try and work clothes. And I shadowed a few women and talked to some of the social workers that work there. And I really wanted to know, you know, why does it matter if these women, you know, wear a suit or they wear, you know, um, something else in their closet? Uh, and the women that were sort of coming up from hard situations, as well as the social workers, all explained that, like, the clothing that these women are wearing to try to get their lives together, to get back into the workforce, this is their strength for them. Like, this makes them feel a certain way. Uh, and it's the inside and the outside from, you know, the interview's perspective, what are we like it, whether we like it or not, they are being judged based on their appearance. It's how they look. Um, and from their perspective, you know, if they feel good 
in their clothes, then they, they, they're more likely to be comfortable in their own skin. And I mean, how many of us have felt uncomfortable in our own skin? Um, you know, so being able to wear clothes that make you feel good and, uh, you know, act a certain way, this is really, really essential to the professional process. Uh, and you know, that, I think that's a really, really good example of how people, you know, take clothes and are able to sort of transform their experience. And it, it might seem so superficial, but I really, really think it works. You know, I've, I followed along some of these women along their process, uh, you know, from recovery to getting a job placement and so on. And the clothes really, really make a difference for them. Right. It's the, it's the idea that you dress for the job that you want, not for the job that you have. That's where that, that's where that comes from. Thinking so much as I was growing, teenage years were, were so impressionable. That's when identity is formed. That time period, adolescence, is identity formation. And obviously, we change over time. But the teenage years and in the early 20s, we're really thinking about how we come across to others, how others perceive us. That, that matters a lot. It's called egocentrism. It's like it's how people see us more than how we see the world. And so therefore, we want to project a certain exterior to the world. I don't want to negate the importance of that at all. What, I, what I'm interested in, as you're talking and as I'm thinking, I'm interested in whether or not a focus on externalities can impact either negatively or positively our spiritual pursuits. What I mean by that is on the one hand, I want to make an argument right now. The argument for dressing a certain way, certainly from a religious perspective, and when I say religious, I mean Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and within Judaism, Orthodox, conservative, whatever you, however you want to, I want an argument to dress a certain way is that you're making two claims. Claim number one is I'm part of this community. And by dressing in this way, I really take pride in this community. They're saying that I really love my community and I want to be part of that. And I want to feel like I'm part of that. And by the way, every single community does this in different ways. Like you said, the J Crew folks hang out with the J Crew folks. You want to feel a certain way when you're wearing J Crew clothing. You want to feel a certain way. I have friends who are like come from mega wealthy families and they wear like these like, you know, these like tattered clothing. And like they're, they're what they're saying is I want to be part of that world. That's my world. The second aspect that I think is positive is that is there any line that in the world of how we dress mattering from, from a religious perspective is there a world in which i can walk around in a string bikini me and all my husband, right walk around a string bikini why not Ooh. i'll go to shoulder string bikini i'll go to work uh, work in a string bikini or or do we think that there is a line and the debate is merely about what the line is i want to say first and foremost that i'm not a halakhic authority whatsoever on the laws of modesty if you have questions if anyone in the audience has questions uh definitely refer to your local orthodox or non-denominational rabbi that is what i recommend personally for how i feel in regards to what the line is i think like society is constantly evolving you brought up the example of like bringing a sh wearing a string bikini to, to shul i mean that would be ridiculous because that is just not like the ultimate decorum but if you want to talk about you know um wearing no socks to shul or wearing different types of wearing different types of clothes to shul and so on i think it is um, it really just depends on uh, the sense of decorum that you're trying to establish for that place. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with um, what body parts have to be covered up um, or, you know, it, it's really, it's, it's also about acting. It's like how you act, how you speak. Um, I think those are just as important in modesty values. Yeah, but you know, the thing that's interesting to me, Javi, is I, I think that what you're talking about is equally relevant to boys. And it's a very difficult conversation. But there are many things that, you know, I, if I'm going to take the argument for how young women are dressing, I think that we should also be paying attention one way or the other to how young men are dressing as well. A hundred percent. I totally agree with you. I think boys are left out of this conversation a lot. I would just say that when it comes to modesty and dress code and so on, for whatever reason, we tend to focus more on girls' bodies. It's just the way it is. I want to play the other side and actually make a case for a dress code. But something very different when we're talking about dress code and rules and modesty, um, I actually think um, there is a lot of value th uh, to be placed with uh, rules about what type of labels you can wear to school. Um, 
as you know, you had mentioned before that in your youth and your adolescence, uh, you are choosing, you know, what type of labels to wear. And adolescence is when a lot of people begin to realize the limits of power and class. And a lot of that is expressed in clothing. For schools, I think that uh, it, it actually could be very, very beneficial uh, to, uh, frankly, to ask students not to wear uh, certain logos or certain labels to school. Because if we're talking about distractions, I think that that creates a certain um, certain levels of status um, and is is able to uh, create um, spaces in 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 school settings where students are trying to one up each other. When you are a kid, all you see are these labels and you know, in, you know, you're coming, you don't really have an understanding of money, but you see, you see an alligator on a shirt or you see a moose on a shirt and you understand that, you know, these, these type of labels, they, they tell you a story about, you know, the brand, but also about the type of shopper who is going to these stores and how much money do they have and how much money can they spend on a shirt or a sweatshirt and so on. And these are deeply rooted ideas in our society that we are able to reflect in our clothes. Um, I remember personally being in sleepaway camp in fifth or sixth grade. There were a lot of different types of girls in my bunk. And I remember there was, there was this one girl from Long Island. I don't remember her name. Um, and the first week of camp, people were like lining up for days to borrow this one sweatshirt from her. Mm. It was a black sweatshirt. And I remember one time telling a friend, like, you can borrow my sweatshirt. I have a black zip up. Mm. And she's like, no, but this one is from the brand Juicy. This is zipper had mm. a J. You know, for anyone who is familiar with this, you know, very popular early aughts brand Juicy Couture, it just, it was so simple. It was just like a velour zip up, but it had so much meaning in power and class and money and like the type of, the type of messages that you want to send people when you wear it. Um, and again, like, you know, there are certain ways you can argue that this is a element of self-expression and people want to buy the clothes because you're able to, you're able to flash a certain level or status for friends. But I think when it comes to being able to show that type of power at school, I think it could be really distracting or really harmful for students. So if there is going to be an element of a dress code at school, I would just say for, um, people who are, who are, who are concerned about the type of messages that clo clothing, uh, sends at a young age, you know, you might want to remove the elements um, of money and status uh, in, in the labels that you are and aren't allowed to wear to school, at least visibly. Does that make sense? So I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you a ridiculous story about this. When I was 14 years old, ninth grade, I had a high school girlfriend um, who j tried to do something really nice for me. She bought me an Abercrombie shirt for my birthday. Uh, I was this kid who was like conscious of being anti-labels as a 14 year old. And I didn't want an Abercrombie shirt. I didn't want any labels, no labels on any of my clothing. When she gave me the Abercrombie shirt, this is not a nice thing that I did. I crossed off the Abercrombie sign. It was on the sleeve. Oh my God. It's like 80 bucks right there. And I would walk around the school with an Abercrombie shirt that markered over the Abercrombie. It was totally incredible gesture by, by her. And what I, I think what I was conscious of is exactly what you're talking about, which is I didn't want to come across as an Abercrombie guy, as someone that, you know, is represented by this or represents yeah. this. Abercrombie is like a case study for a brand that was rooted in toxic masculinity, right? I mean, inadvertently or not, like a lot of the teenage boys that were shopping there were sold all these messages of, you know, what is a boy supposed to look like? What is he supposed to right. smell like? By the way, talk about, talk about snoot. Like <laughs> it, that, those, you know, those, those are, if we're talking about that, those you go, I'm, I'm not having my daughter walk into an Abercrombie store. That's for sure. <laughs> or, or son. I don't know if you've been in an Abercrombie in the last like five to seven years, but the brand has completely done a makeover because of the shifting ways in which our society talks about masculinity now. It's now all about inclusivity and plus size and gender neutral because this is the way in which, you know, our society is, is moving when we talk about clothing and, and, um, and how we express ourselves. It's not about exclusivity and looking a certain way and, you know, the washboard abs and the size to, you know, society is moving more towards inclusivity. Um, and that is a lot of the messages that, you know, brands are trying to send now to keep up with how we think about ourselves. In clothing. I want to talk about other elements of fashion and other elements of dress in, in the Jewish world. So Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has this other idea that he shares that, you know, that Judaism ultimately cares less about appearances, um, more about ethics, not power, more about character, not the formal dress of the office. And what he's what he's referring to in this context 
is that while other religions, you wear a certain thing, and by wearing that thing, you are the Pope. By wearing this piece, th th by wearing this garment, you are, you know, this leader in Islam. In, in Judaism, he makes the argument that you don't have to look so differently to be the religious leader, the religious authority. And at the, on the other hand, I think that there's a lot of focus on dress in Judaism and what we choose to wear. I'll give you an example. So I'm wearing tzitzit right now, right? These little guys right here, the, the, the strings, you know, that's part of what I choose to wear every single day. And wearing it does something for me. It reminds me of the mitzvot, the commandments, to behave as a Jew as best as possible. I don't always do it, but as best as possible, you know, to wear a kippah. Why do I wear a kippah? because it tells me something. By me choosing to wear a kippah signals to others and to me that I am of the Jewish faith, that I am part of the Jewish people. And hopefully inwardly, it reminds me of something which I think is important, which is you know having a relationship between me and God and looking upwards and having that reminder. And I like feeling that reminder. I like having that reminder. Uh, so, that's another aspect of this conversation that you said earlier that Judaism does care. Um, Judaism does have something to say about our fashion. What did you mean by that? Yeah, um, I think that our religion is one that is deeply intertwined with fashion. Um, if you just if you just look at the Torah, I mean, we just finished the Sefer Bereshit. There are there are many instances where the Torah goes out of its way, and in the Book of Genesis, there are multiple instances where the Torah goes out of its way to describe textiles um and you know I, there's there's one instance where it talks about uh joseph and his ev evolution in in egypt and it talks you know he talked big day shesh like he he is elevated in egypt and he puts on special clothing um and it sort of like exemplifies uh you know his elevation and status and if you look at the one of my favorite examples is um in Megillat Esther, in the book of Esther, when also it talks about the evolution of Mordechai, you know, at the end it says it, it describes the type of clothing that he's wearing. Also, again, another example biblically is the, the big day kahuna, the type of clothes that the Kohanim wore. Um, you know, the Torah goes to excruciating detail to talk about the color. Kohanim being the early, the priests. Exactly, exactly. The Torah goes through great detail to talk about color and textiles and materials and so on. Um, and I think what they're trying to tell us is that the clothing is a different way to demonstrate self-expression um, and how it makes us feel, but also um, communicating how how others are supposed to feel about us. Um, and I, actually, the flip side is um, one of the first things that Jews do when they are grieving, when they go through the process of Avilus, is they rip their clothing. Um, you know, that is like an outward expression of like, I am in grief, I am mm. suffering right now, and I'm going to show uh, externally, um, I'm going to, I'm going to rip this piece of clothing. And I think that is, uh, that is really just uh, exemplifies how important we feel about clothing. Um, one of my favorite pieces of uh, Jewish communal garb is uh, what we call like a bekisha. Uh It's a long robe. You like bekishas. What do you like about bekishas? Um, well, for 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 those of your listeners who are not familiar, it's a long robe that Hasidic Jews wear uh, on Friday night. Um, maybe there are some sects where people wear it all the time. Um, and um, for for the, for the Hasidic community, the men get to wear um, these bekishas, these long robes. And for the leaders, for the rabbeim, um, they will wear these long robes with incredibly intricate fabrics like there's flowers and there's gold woven in and it is it is so incredible um and i think most people would think like oh hasidic jews they all wear black and white and they're supposed to blend in but then you see like the rebbe sitting at the head of the table and he's wearing this um this robe it's almost like something out of a fairy tale like something that a king would wear and it, it just it really demonstrates like the power and status that you know some of these great hasidic rebbe's have um you know, over their community, but also over themselves, you know, like they, they put on the robe and then they assume this persona. I think it just goes to show you like the, the type of power that some of our religious garments have. It's so interesting that, that it's so I, I from having a conversation with you that, that, that intrigues me that you think that that's, um, an exciting thing. Like, cause I think that meaning like what, like there's something about it. I'm like, it's very different than the idea that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is saying, which is fine that you know that the inwardness matters a lot more than appearances 
and in Judaism. But with the Hasidic Rebbe's, I think you're right that they're that the Hasidic Rebbe's it really does matter what they choose to wear. Whereas in if you go to a, a conservative synagogue or a reform synagogue or an orthodox synagogue, they're going to just dress the the rabbi, so to speak, is going to just dress like the way everyone else is dressed, right? So like there's that there's that distinction. It's just, I don't know why. That's interesting. Maybe maybe more like maybe more uh, of our rabbis can start wearing bekishes. <laughs> maybe that's maybe we can see that and see see what comes of that. I don't know. So I'm personally interested in this question, Javi, to be self focused for a minute here. Do you think I'm trying to signal anything to you or to the people around me when I'm when I'm out picking up pizza, picking up my kids from school, um, whatever it is, and I'm wearing a T-shirt and I look like this? Am I signaling anything? Hmm. or no and a second question on that if i was wearing a button-down shirt right now and and you saw me with it because we're on the screen right now button-down shirt with my seat seat hanging out uh like on the side would you view me differently would it would would the nature of our conversation be different okay well when you are bringing uh religious symbols into the picture i think the nature of the conversation would be different i think for people who are not familiar with those garments, it could be really intimidating, right? There's a, there's definitely a stance and it's a look, it's a vibe when somebody wears their CC out versus in, uh, right? You, you are definitely signaling to the world. You are sending a message, uh, making this religious garment visible. Um, so definitely you are sending, you, you, you are letting people know. In terms of wearing a t-shirt versus wearing a button down, I think that if you and I had had this conversation in 2019, I probably would have said, oh, you know, somebody's wearing a t-shirt instead of a button down. That means he wants to dress more casual. Maybe he, he didn't really put so much thought into his clothes. He got up this morning and he thought like, I'm chilling it down a bit, but we are living in such a different time. And I think, you know, okay. in COVID, post COVID, okay. I'm still recovering from COVID. So I'd say like, we're still in COVID. Right. Um, right. You know, the, the, the rules and the parameters for which we dress and how we dress have changed so much because people are at home. Um, and there have been, there's been like a mass demonstration of the casualization of work. You even have like Goldman Sachs guys like wearing jeans and like they'll never wear suits ever again, right. which is crazy because like that is the quintessential suit bro, you know? Yeah. Um, so the fact there's just, there's overall casualization. So I would say today when I see you in a t-shirt, I don't really think anything. Now, if you had showed up to a job interview in a t-shirt, you are probably signaling something. Uh huh. That, that's a fa that's a great distinction. And if I'm wearing a T-shirt in a context, if I'm going to synagogue, I'm signaling something, right? Or to a wedding, if I'm wearing a great T-shirt to a wedding, like what what what's going on there? There are contexts that how we show up and the clothing we wear matters, and we should pay attention to that. I also think I th this is really interesting. Um, a whole another discussion, but I think a lot of this is generational. Um, you know, one of my, uh, my, my husband and partner, one of his stories was when he came back from studying abroad in Israel, he was wearing sandals and he went to Minyan. He went to pray at a shul and an older man came over to him and was just beside himself that my husband Yoni was wearing sandals inside a synagogue. And, you know, my husband just like looked at him and was like, that's why you're upset. Like I'm here. I made it. You know, I was like, on my way to class and you know i had somewhere else to be but i made it here for minion and you were so focused on my shoes um but i think for maybe for like an older generation where um you know the synagogue and this the the ritual house was something that was like so sacred and so formal and you had to like dress a certain way and act a certain way uh, and even like think right. a certain way about it um that uniform uh is very very specific and it is very formal but i think today uh, at least, you know, just from what I've seen and experienced, it's become a lot more casual. Um, and I think that says something about the way in which we practice and also in the way in which our Judaism has evolved. And if you talk to someone based on age, they probably will have feelings pro or con. I agree. And I also think the state of Israel contributed to that, how Israelis come to pray. And the when Americans, Australians, South Africans visit Israel and they see the the casualness in certain communities that that's like you said earlier society is relevant to how we dress and so that's 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 part of the conversation as well when you spend time with israelis you dress a certain way when you spend time in different communities you dress a different way and so uh that's uh that's a fascinating insight
There's something else that uh, I think interests you that I know very little about, and that is the world of fashion consumption. Could you talk to us about the 2021 fashion consumption cycle and why it matters to you and what we should be aware of? Yeah. Um, thank you for asking. This is a topic that I'm really passionate about. Uh, as a fashion reporter, I think a lot of people would be surprised that my response when they ask me what to buy is don't buy anything. Um, <laughs> and obviously I'm joking a little bit, but not really. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, when today in, uh, 2021, um, according to one trade group, the American Apparel Footwear Association, um, the average shopper buys 68 items of clothing a year. Um, and that mm. number used to be closer to 40 in the 1990s. In 2017, 13 million tons of textile waste uh, was either dumped into a landfill or burned. Um, I'm, sure, wow. I'm sure you know that there's an environmental crisis that's happening right now, and textile waste is a major contributor. Um, people are just buying more things than ever before. Uh, and if you look at, you know, if you want to talk about economics for a second, um, the I do, I do. The, the cost of everything over the last two, three decades has gone up, right? The cost of food, the cost of, right. uh, the cost of goods, the cost of lumber and so on. But the only thing that has gotten cheaper over the years is clothing. Um, and that is because mm. of the rise of a segment called fast fashion. Uh, if you go into the mall, no, I don't know how much shopping you do. Um, but there are these huge mega brands. Uh, in fast fashion, specifically Zara, H&M, Forever oh 21. Um, and the, You're the, the only two places that I shop from are Zara and, <laughs> and H&M. Okay. So now, okay, so what do I need to learn? I mean, you're not, you're not alone. These stores okay. make, you know, tens of billions of dollars a year. And uh, these, these brands, um, pioneered by Zara and moving into brands like H&M and digital companies like Boohoo and ASOS uh, and newcomers like Shein, uh, based in China, they have basically fueled the consumption of fashion uh, on speed. And then brands like Zara and H&M are putting out, you know, speeded up the process thanks to uh, cheap labor and um, materials made out of plastics and microfibers. Um, and basically went from putting out 6,000 new items a year to 6,000 new items a month. And now you have brands like Shein, they're putting out 6,000 new styles a day. Wow. And the reason why they're able to do that is because they're producing in countries that don't really have such um, transparent labor laws. Um, and they're, like I said, they're using materials um, that are really, really cheap. And you might think like, who cares if I buy cheap clothing, I can throw it out after one or two wears and, you know, I'd be done with it. Um, but between the, the plastics that are going into um, our waters when, when you wash them in the washing machine or you give your clothing away and it goes to Goodwill and then it goes to this place and this place and then it ends up in a landfill in the Chilean deserts or in Africa, in Ghana. Um, and it just creates this uh, mountains and mountains of textile waste that is contributing to the crisis. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really uncomfortable to have this conversation because people love to yeah. shop. And, you know, if you're in my field, in your fashion, you love clothing, you love design, and you wanna, you wanna buy what you wanna buy, you wanna be in on the trends. Um, but I think, you know, as, as, as Jews and frankly, as religious people, like we have a moral obligation, um, to stop and ask ourselves, you know, why do we need things? You know, why, why am uh -huh. I buying this thing? How am I contributing to the environmental crisis, um, to, you know, potentially, um, a hazardous labor laws that are coming from some of these factories? I mean, there's, there's a lot that's been written about labor laws. Um, but I will say that I think that there is a Jewish response to this. Uh, you know, there's the concept of baltashli and not throwing things away. Um, and I, I understand that it is very, very tricky for our community specifically because, you know, uh, we're one that is rooted in family and children. And I know, you know, growing up, like, we would always get new clothing for, you know, for Chagim, for the holidays. And we would get new clothing. Well, that's a big thing. Yeah. That's a, that's actually a Jewish law. There's a Jewish law that you should get new, beautiful clothing exactly. for holidays in order to in order to honor the holiday. Exactly. And, you know, people want to shop and buy new items for family occasions. Um, and I'm not saying that people need to stop buying things, but I, I definitely want to advocate for people to change the way they think about fashion and consumption and also maybe change the way that we shop. You know, there's the rise of all these tech companies that are selling secondhand clothes. And it's so easy to buy used clothing. It's so much better for the environment. Um, Hand-me-downs is, is an incredible tradition that I love to have, you know, passing along uh, clothes and um, from family members. And also just 
being more mindful. I'm not sure I had a new piece of clothing till I was like 13, 14 years old because I have an older brother two years older than me. So I'm with you on that. I have a different angle on some of the challenges that you're talking about with the world of fashion consumption from a Jewish lens as well, which is I don't want to make a claim that Judaism has anything specific to say in capitalism or socialism. What I do think is interesting, and I want to make this claim, is that Judaism has something to say about consumerism and this uh, a hyper focus on materialism. And I'm not saying the word materialism in a, in a way that's saying that everyone should be ascetic and some monk on a mountain. That's not what I'm making an argument for. But something that I, I do think about is that even in the most religiously observant communities, there is a, a strong tendency to buy, 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 which I, I think goes against this value of uh, what, the way I see it was there's a pasuk, there's a verse in Micha that says, Ma Hashem doresh mcha, what does God ask of you? Ki imasot mishpat, to do justice. Ve'ahavta chesed, you should love kindness. Ve'atsneya lecha im elokecha. And you should, I don't know how to translate that perfectly, but you should either walk sensitively or walk humbly or walk in a in a modest way, however you want to define the word ve'atsneya, um, with, with your God. And being so hyper-focused on buying new articles of clothing, I think that that can distract. Again, I'll use that word. That's the way I think I, I think of this often. It could distract from our personal goals of spiritual nourishment and connecting to something beyond uh, the, the, the most recent purchase or the most recent exciting article of clothing. Now, I want to be clear. I get interested in what I wear also. Like I, I got these cool new Nikes and I'm excited about them. I actually designed them. I, I have fun with them. You know, but I want to be more conscious of it. But it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. I think they can coexist together. Um, I think right. that you can um, care about what you wear and care about what you buy. Uh, but also, like, don't, you know, not let it consume you um, okay. to the point where, like, you know, why I was mentioning before, being wasteful uh, and not yes. thinking about the consequences of what it is that you are buying and where it is going to end up after you are done wearing it once or twice. Um, Javi, Javi, I love that idea of being not being wasteful. That that is something that, like for me, this is a huge takeaway. I'll tell you why I love the idea. And sorry for interrupting you, but I, I just keep on thinking about it. It's because we should also not just from the value, all the other values that you spoke about, environmentalism, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Also, it teaches us the value of appreciation, and teaches us the value of moving past instant gratification. Oh, I want that. As opposed to appreciating the things that we have and enjoying them. Exactly. And like, like really enjoying exactly. them. Exactly. Um, and also, you know, I, I just want to reiterate that, like, you know, I don't want to, I'm not here to like shame people. Um, and like you said before, you know, uh, Judaism isn't so invested in materialism, but as we've been discussing up until now, it, it really is. And what we wear matters and it matters because of how it makes us feel. It matters because of the way in which other people perceive us. Uh, so I think right. that it is important, but it again, not to be, not to let it consume you, um, and also to understand that like there's there are Jewish values that you can practice every single day uh, in how you shop and how you dress um, and what it means for other people as well. Let's end on that, Javi. I really appreciate you coming and sharing your thoughts. You are someone that understands the world of fashion, understands the world of Judaism. Uh, better than better than most people out there and so you sharing your wisdom out really matters and we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us thank you so much for having me this was really a journey i really enjoyed it i want to end this episode by coming back to torah the book of brashid of genesis is the story of the beginning of the jewish people from eden to egypt and rabbi jonathan sachs of blessed memory noted that so many episodes in genesis turn on the subject of clothes there's Esav's Big Day Chamudot, his best clothes that his twin Jacob takes and wears to receive Isaac's blessing. There is the Ketonet Pasim, the richly embroidered cloak or coat of many colors that Jacob gifts to his favorite son Joseph. There are the clothes of a prostitute that Tamar puts on where she removes her widow's garments in order to attract Judah. There is the Beged, the cloak that Joseph leaves in the hand of Potiphar's wife when he flees from her attempt to seduce him. And there are the special clothes and insignia of office that Joseph wears as second in command to Pharaoh. And here's the kicker. Garments are used to deceive. Jacob wears Esau's clothes to trick his blind father Isaac when he puts out his hand to feel him. 
The brothers stained Joseph's cloak with goat's blood to persuade their father Jacob that he had been killed by a wild animal. Tamar changes her clothes and puts on a veil to hide her identity from Judah. Potiphar's wife uses the robe Joseph had abandoned to bolster her claim that he tried to rape her. And Joseph uses his newfound appearance as a senior Egyptian ruler to hide his identity from his brothers. All over Genesis, clothes are part and parcel of betrayal. It comes as no wonder then that the Hebrew word for garment, beged, also means betrayal. Bet gimel dalad. I love Hebrew. What a language. But this is my final thought. And with this, I'll leave you. I had a realization during this Chavi conversation, and it's stuck with me since. The reason my kippah means something to me, or the reason a bekesha means something to Chavi, is because it's tied so strongly to the person. When I'm wearing tzitzit, they're usually tucked in, but sometimes these little strings are flying out. Is that me trying to signal something to the outside world, to my inner world? When I'm running late and my kippa falls off and I pause just for a moment to pick it up, I'm reminding myself, this is what matters. And I hope I'm constantly making that choice. Look, does fashion matter? Does clothing matter? Does what we wear matter? I don't know that it does objectively, but subjectively, when I look at myself in the mirror, I don't want to care what kind of watch I'm wearing. Not a big watch wearer. Or shoes, though seriously, these Nikes I had made are pretty fly. I want to make sure my outside matches my inside. Rabbi Gamliel's famous Tanaitic plea for all of us to be Toho Kiboro, for our insides to match our outsides. My clothes are honest about who I am in my core. I don't want to be lying to myself about myself. So yes, how we dress matters. What we choose to wear matters. Does that mean we obsess over it? No. Does it mean we pay attention to it? Yes. At the end of the day, I want to leave you with a thought from the great Hasidic luminary, Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. He says, don't worry about the state of someone else's soul and the needs of your body. Worry about the needs of someone else's body and the state of your own soul. With regard to dress, the way I understand that is this. Yes, focus on how you dress. Make sure that it's reflecting both who you are and who you aspire to be. But don't focus on other people's dress. Let's judge ourselves. Let's not judge others. That's a lesson I'm walking away with here. Power Of is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Check out JewishUnpacked.com for everything Unpacked related and subscribe to our other podcasts. Follow Unpacked at all the social media places. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. And most of all, write to us. Maybe send a pic of your OOTD, outfit of the day, I kid, I kid, at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com. This episode was produced by Rifki Stern. And audio magic, that's Rob Para. I'm your host, Noam Weissman. Thanks for listening. <laughs>